Good evening, everyone. It's great to see the audience full, and it's wonderful for us to be together on an event um, like tonight, which really celebrates the kinds of things that the Academy does so well. It's bringing together creativity, bringing together intellectual pursuits, and having it all happen in the same space. Um, so we have a lot of people to thank tonight, and I won't take very much time uh, because we have a, a great panel uh, discussion ahead of us. Can you all hear? Yes. Hi, I'm Mark Robbins. I'm uh, president of the American Academy in Rome. And um, tonight, uh, we are here for the opening of June Jordan, the poetry of design. Uh, we'll have the panel in a moment. This is the first exhibition of June Jordan's work, and we're very, very pleased uh, to be showing this lesser known project between June Jordan and Buckminster uh, Fuller to, to develop public housing in the wake of the 1964 riots in Harlem. This has become an iconic project. It breaks almost all of the rules of urban design and yet manages to make a, a strong actual project for the intersection between architecture and um, social life. You'll see this in, uh, in the galleries. And it is really a critique not only of the immediate moment in uh, the late 60s and early 70s, but it's a moment of radical reassessment of American society and the intersection uh, with architecture. June Jordan, as many of you know, um, is better known as a journalist and as a poet and an activist. We see all of that in her work uh, in the galleries. In 1970, June Jordan was a fellow in environmental design. Uh, and this is a category that had a brief life at uh, the American Academy in Rome. And the nomenclature itself was really a, a way for uh, academics to re-envision the intersection between uh, sociology, geography, architecture, and social practice. Uh, it was a way of making architecture seem in ways less heroic more engaged with the culture which would then inhabit it. Uh, this was really something that a discussion in Berkeley started on the West Coast, and environmental design then spread across the country and has really fallen into disuse. But it's interesting to see at an institution like the Academy, which was so much about reinforcing the canon, that in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a change in the nomenclature here as well, and an effort to reflect the ways in which our understanding of architecture and social practice had changed. Uh, Jordan was one of the few uh, women to be a fellow uh, in the arts at this time. Uh, in arts or architecture, and she's the first uh, woman of color. Uh, and she brought this voice to the academy as a feminist, as an artist, and as an activist in Rome. We acknowledge the Terra Foundation for American Art for providing support for this exhibition, as well as the estate of Buckminster Fuller, the June Jordan Literary Estate Trust, and Bloomberg Philanthropies, as well as the Whitney Museum of American Art for their loan. I'll thank first the members of tonight's panel who are um, fellows and colleagues, uh, Yolanda Daniels, who's a resident, Sean Anderson, who's a fellow, and Lindsay Harris, both a fellow and our high school arts director. But perhaps the most signature acknowledgement should be for Whitfield, Whitfield Lavelle, uh, because it's really his work researching the academy and thinking critically about the history of this institution that yielded two 
beautiful portraits, which you'll see up in our bar, also not a neutral location. It is a, a very particular field of action upstairs. And if you haven't been into the bar to see these, please do go up and see those. These portraits were both of June Jordan and of Ulysses K who was the first African-American at the Academy. He was in musical composition. And he came to the Academy through a link between the Fulbright and the Academy, which was really uh, connected by the then director, Lawrence Roberts, who was able to see the bright, talented people coming through the Fulbright and uh, make sure that they could spend more time uh, here in Rome and specifically at the American Academy. And so it's really Whitfield's work that create, created the nucleus for this project. And we're very, very grateful for the gift that Whitfield has made of those portraits upstairs. They will remain part of the legacy and the way we view the institution going forward. I'd love to give a round of applause for Whitfield. David and I went to see the show in New York last year. Beautiful, just a whole room and just fantastic set of portraits. So we're so delighted as an institution to have these. Uh, our curator, uh, who is, um, has been working with the Academy in, in so many ways over the past years as Mellon professor and high school arts director and as a fellow herself, is a photo historian, a wonderful scholar, uh, Lindsay Harris. And, and it's actually the sign of a good scholar and curator to know when uh, she's found something of great and profound interest and import. And she saw those portraits and was able to take this material and produce the exhibition that you'll see in our galleries um, after uh, the panel. So this exhibition in this project, I'd like to think is part of a trajectory of exhibitions and projects we've done at the Academy over the past 10 years to interrogate our own history as an institution, and by that to understand uh, the nuances of the American political and social scene. It is only at places like the Academy where we see at times radical juxtapositions between the arts and the humanities and people who have very, very different views and gainsaying very complex and difficult histories that makes the Academy unique. I've been honored to lead the institution for almost 10 years now and it has been just a, a fantastic set of experiences. So I'm grateful uh, for that. I'm grateful also for the leadership that we've had. And uh, I do want to thank our director, Elisa Wong, for her personal commitment. Her leadership is compassionate as it is intelligent, and it's what helps drive the institution forward. And so with that, I'd love to bring um, exhibition curator Lindsay Harris to the podium uh, and who will welcome our panelists and give us a little more information about the exhibition that you'll see in the gallery. Lindsay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the American Academy in Rome. I'm Lindsay Harris, the Andrew High School Arts Director and curator of the exhibition, June Jordan, The Poetry of Design. This is a show that explores the early career of June Jordan when she brimmed with the potential to be many things, including the celebrated poet and activist that we know today, but not only. 
From the mid-1960s, when she collaborated with architect Buckminster Fuller on an urban plan for Harlem, as Mark has just mentioned, to the early 1970s, when she earned the Rome Prize in Environmental Design, she also forged new directions in architecture. Poems, photographs, illustrated essays, and children's books, these and other popular media shape our built environment in addition to buildings, her work declares. And what is more, these forms are accessible to the public and can empower people beyond academia to participate in the change-making process. This exhibition, as Mark has noted, along with its accompanying catalog, exemplify the mission of this academy, to think across disciplines and understand anew the potency of the arts and humanities to make a positive difference in the world. And I'm grateful to the many partners and lenders who made the show possible, which are too numerous to name specifically, but I would like to indicate in particular the Schlesinger Library at Harvard University's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, which houses the June Jordan Papers, and her literary trust estate, which supported this initiative from start to finish. I also wish to express more gratitude than I can put into words for the team in the Academy's programs office that transformed an initial inkling into the exhibition we are inaugurating this evening. Lexi Eberspacher, the show's assistant curator, Anne Colson and Laura Cabezas demonstrated professionalism and camaraderie each and every day. Fabio Panacchia and Stefano Genna brought the installation to life. Sara Nunziata and Costanza Paisan made the catalog a reality, as did its authors, one of whom, Cristina Yuli, is somewhere here with us this evening. I've only met her virtually, and I look forward to meeting her in person. To the many other Academy staff members, to former and current directors Elizabeth Rodini and Elisa Wong, and to Academy President Mark Robbins, I am very grateful for your support. Tonight, we are extremely fortunate indeed to welcome to the Academy the artist whose work inspired this entire endeavor and has served as my guiding light throughout its formation, Whitfield Lavelle. An artist gifted with a keen visual sensitivity, in particular for people, Whitfield has earned international renown for celebrating the lives of anonymous African Americans through portraiture. His art, awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 2007, has been the focus of acclaimed exhibitions for over three decades, opening our eyes to the often ordinary people whose stories and memories have shaped the collective American past. The most recent of these, Whitfield Lavelle Passages, a major retrospective of his work organized by the American Federation of the Arts, opened mere weeks ago uh, at the Boca Raton Museum of Art in Florida, and it will travel to at least five venues in the United States through 2025. So should you find yourself in America, look for it. Beyond this show, his work can be seen in some of the most important museums active today, including the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC, and through June 11th here at the American Academy in Rome. As a resident at the Academy in 2019, Whitfield found himself in Rome in the throes of the pandemic, when the institution, like the rest of the world, had come to a halt. The extended time in the Academy building led to a conversation with my predecessor, Elizabeth Rodini, about the institution's display of fellows' portraits, a form of imagery very dear to his heart, at the Academy's bar. Who do these portraits represent? Who looks at them, and what do they reveal about the Academy's history? His response to these questions, in light of his decades-long experience as an artist dedicated to portraiture, is the reason we are all gathered here this evening. There is no one better to share this origin story within the context of his art than the artist himself. It is thus with my profound gratitude for his generosity, his art, and the many ways he has inspired me to grow as a scholar, a curator, and as a per person, that I am delighted to welcome to the podium Whitfield Lavelle. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I should say is that the Academy has really, um, it's really taken a piece of my heart. Uh, I came here first in 2018, right? 2018. And uh, that was actually a time of uh, great personal loss. And 
I found the combination of the, stu the studio time, the, of course, the beauty of Rome, but the, the staff and the fellows were just so instrumental in me healing from my grief. And I feel very much indebted to the Academy. And I wanted to give something back. Now, <clears throat> at the time, uh, the, the first winter that I spent here, I started a series not really realizing what I was doing, but <clears throat> that's how I work. And it became the Venturiza series. It was inspired by um, Schubert's uh, Venturiza, which is Winter's Journey. Uh, t uh, about, it's a song cycle about um, a, a man who is trudging through the snow to escape grief and uh, loss of love. So I did these pieces. They're, they're now in shadow boxes, so you see they all have objects and so on. I did them uh, rigorously. For, uh, I, made, I made 26 of them, one for each song in the cycle. And then I made an extra two. And uh, that was part of my healing. And I, and I will say that I went back to New York with a lighter heart and, and an extremely uh, wonderful feeling about Rome. I had been here, I had been to Rome about six or seven times. So during that residency, I didn't have to run around and sightsee. I just spent my time in the studio and got the work done. And it was, uh, this is one of my um, installations of the Venturiza series, a portion of the Venturiza series. Now, <clears throat> when I came back uh, the following uh, winter, when Fred had a residency. Um, I, of course, I wanted to get to work and I didn't want to go back to the black, uh, the, those are those, uh, the silver Conte on black paper. I wanted to move forward. And so somehow the color red, sim and then I realized in retrospect, the color red symbolized life whereas the black was the death that, the deaths that I had been uh, experiencing. So <clears throat> I went to Poggi and bought up a lot of red paper. <laughs> and I was very, all I can say is I really enjoyed being here. I really enjoyed the experience. Now somewhere <clears throat> along the line, um, the first winter, um, John Ossenbach, Voth, you know what I mean, John. Okay. <laughs> he had been talking about the portraits in the espresso bar and the fact that Behind the espresso bar, I thought it was a gorgeous presentation, but there were all of the, what they call the old guard, you know, mom and chops and pipes, and they were kind of uh, homogenous, we'll say. And <laughs> <laughs> so there was some talk between uh, John and Elizabeth Rondini about uh, m making use of the diversity that has become part of the academy. And so these people should be reflected in the espresso bar also. So I started thinking, and uh, John 
then gave me a whole stack of uh, Xerox copies of people who had been fellows because you need to be you need to have been a fellow in order to have your your portrait on the wall. You couldn't just be a mere resident, which was what I was. <laughs> so <clears throat> the um, I had uh, he gave me uh, like five men from the past. Obviously, I work from images from the past, from you know the beginning of photography until around the 1960s and 70s. And <clears throat> so he gave me about five. Uh, former fellows, and there were a couple I had known, one that I didn't like, and uh, I, I, I really felt something for Ulysses K. I, I liked his face, I liked, you know, his story, and I felt I could do something with him. And so then, Fred and I, we couldn't get enough of the Academy, okay? So we started coming back we came back a third time, and someone said, why don't you do uh, a woman also? So I was given a stack of, by, by Elizabeth, a stack of materials on uh, women fellows. And this was June Jordan, I believe around the time that she was here at the Academy. I'm, I, I don't know that for sure, but she had been a special person to me ever since I was about 23. She, <clears throat> I, you know, when I was young, in high school and college, I wanted to do it all, you know, and you think you can. I was a singer, I was a, a, a writer, poet, and a painter, and then, by the time that, you know, when you finish college and you find out about rent and stuff like that, <laughs> you realize you can't do it all. So I had to let go of the poetry, but I discovered her work and I felt we had such a kindred spirit that I was, I was thrilled to know that she was the first African-American woman to be a fellow here. And so that gave me an opportunity to pay homage to someone that I felt something for, and also to give something back to the academy. Oops, I just skipped. I love that pensive photo. So. This was the book that I found in the Upper West Side when I was about 22, and I was still writing poetry, and I just fell in love with her. Um, I fell in love with her voice, and actually I, I kind of feel that if I had kept writing, uh, we would have had similar uh, ways of expressing ourselves in writing. And so <clears throat> I chose to do this uh, this image of her, and because of the book, I, 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 I found out the translation for the name of the previous book, Things I Like to Do in the Dark. I checked the grammar with about five Italians. Cose che faccio nel buio. And <clears throat> The interesting thing that I want to want to want to want to point out is that one one day, I we, Fred and I were going around to shops, etc., and which we all I love to shop, and uh, I saw that brooch, and it said June Jordan on it. You know, I just said I gotta have that, and I was going to somehow either work it into my piece of June Jordan or I was going to create the piece around that brooch. Uh, <clears throat> um, I thought of it at the time as like a shining star or 
uh, an award or something, you know, something that glistens. And um, much to my delight, um, Lindsay told me about a poem in in her her collection called Ah Mama, where she describes rummaging through her mother's trinkets, and they're they're like uh, costume jewelry. It reminded me when it, I mean. The, hearing about the poem and having read it the other day, it reminded me of the way I work, you know, because I work with objects and I have all these boxes of trinkets and things when I'm working, I have to find stuff. So, <clears throat> in that poem, Ah Mama, she, met, she has a line where she says that, uh, um, the, the, her mother's costume jewelry uh, glistened, shone and glistened like, uh, like rubies. And so I like to think I was channeling her or she was tapping me on the shoulder telling me, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's us. Thank you. Thank you, Whitfield, for those very moving remarks about how we all came to be here today to celebrate the work that's upstairs, which you'll see culminates with this very special portrait that has, in the same way that June Jordan's taken a special place in your heart, this work and what it came from is now inside mine. Um, so one of the things that I found so fascinating about this project as I delved deeper into it is how very well known June Jordan is as, as a poet. Uh, yet it's only recently that she's begun to earn recognition in architecture. And the two speakers we will hear from in this next part of our program before we welcome all speakers up to the stage to discuss some of the ideas raised are really at the vanguard of the scholars and practitioners bringing to light Jordan's accomplishments in this realm and how those achievements encourage us to expand what architecture signifies as a word and as an idea and as a phenomenon that impacts our lived experience. Sean Anderson, who will speak first, is presently an associate professor in architecture and director of the Bachelor in Architecture program at Cornell University. A 2005 Rome Prize Fellow, Sean holds a doctorate in African art history and has practiced as an architect and taught in Afghanistan, Australia, India, Italy, Morocco, Sri Lanka, and the United Arab Emirates. In addition, he has authored books on South Asian ritual sculpture and on the modern architecture of colonial Eritrea, among other topics. Sean's global perspective and experience led him to organize a slate of path-breaking exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where he served for seven years as the associate curator in the Department of Architecture and Design. These included four iterations of the Young Architects program at MoMA PS1, one of which featured current Academy Fellows Jennifer Newsom and Tom Carruthers of Dream the Combine, and MoMA's first ever exhibition dedicated to African American and African diaspora architects, reconstructions, architecture, and blackness in America. Co-organized with Mabel O. Wilson, a 2022 Academy resident, the exhibi exhibition featured work by a number of Academy Fellows, including June Jordan, as he will discuss with us shortly. We will then hear from Yolanda Daniels, Associate Professor of Architecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and co-founder and principal of Studio Sumo. A 2004 Rome Prize Fellow and 2023 Academy resident, Yolanda has also held the Aero Saarinen Visiting Professorship at Yale University and the Silcott Chair at Howard University. Her independent design research explores the spatial effects of race and gender in the built environment, topics, of course, that June Jordan also pursued in her time. Yolanda's work documents and represents spaces that have been rendered adjunct to, yet supplement and maintain dominant spatial and political systems of power. 
taking the form of writing and re design research, her re work has been published and exhibited widely, including the recent anthology In Search of African American Space, Redressing Racism, and in the project Black City, the Los Angeles edition, shown in the MoMA uh, exhibition Reconstructions. Along with other exhibitors in that project, she is co-founder of the Black Reconstruction Collective. Her latest investigations, done in part at the Academy this winter, will be shown in the forthcoming Venice Architecture Biennial, which opens exactly one month from today. Please join me in welcoming first Sean, followed by Yolanda, who will discuss Jordan's legacy in light of Building for Justice today, after which we will open a conversation with all of our illustrious speakers on stage. Thank you. Ah, someone has left this at the podium. Uh, thank you so much. It, uh, first, I have to uh, extend my gratitude to the American Academy. Uh, it's been many years since I was here, but it has never left me. And it's a great privilege to be here this evening to share a very important exhibition, for me at least, and to follow the great Whitfield Lavelle and to be introduced uh, and invited this evening by the great Lindsay Harris and to sit with my friend and colleague and mentor, in a way, Yolanda Daniels. So thank you very, very much for um, this occasion and this invitation. Tonight, I wanted to share uh, a little bit of the thinking behind what became Reconstruction's architecture and blackness in America. And I have to say also, and send my greetings and gratitude, of course, to Mabel Wilson, who sends her love and her, her greetings as well from New York this evening, who's also a great friend and mentor, who I'm very privileged to have worked with on this exhibition. But when I began this exhibition in 2017 in earnest, when I was uh, associate curator at MoMA, uh, it became not only a project that is incredibly dear to me, but it became a project that revealed not, not as much the tensions that we were feeling at the time in 2017, but would ultimately reveal the fissures that uh, not only were opened in 2020 with the murder of George Floyd, but also the fissures of an institution that had long denied or erased or forgotten the presence of black and African diasporic architects in its collections and in its exhibitions. In fact, when I began this project in 2017, there had not ever been an exhibition that included the work of a black architect. And so, with that, with that space of erasure and with that space of loss, Mabel and I, in earnest, began a questioning of how to build. How does one build an archive when it doesn't exist? How do we build communities when they are always present but erased or forgotten or disregarded? And how do we imagine and define spaces when those very same spaces by architects and engineers and designers throughout history have used design in effect to deny the presence and existence of a people. These were heavy, heavy times, and yet it was important, I felt, that uh, we could begin an exhibition with a set of questions around who and what do we build? And I began then a process of looking at the history of uh, American city building and came across this image on our left, uh, on, your, on my left, on our left, of uh, the so-called exodusters. And the exodusters was a, a name or a term coined by those that had escaped or had been emancipated 
uh, from slavery and left the eastern uh, part of the United States and moved westward and moved to places like Boley, Oklahoma and Redbird, Oklahoma uh, and formed cities, in effect, towns and cities founded by and created by African-American individuals and communities, and most often in tandem with and on land, in a sense, owned by Native American people. The Exodusters then, for me, became the impetus for thinking about who do we build for and why. Boley, Oklahoma, at its height in 1922, had over 100,000 individuals of color, Native Americans predominantly, and black Americans. They created businesses, they created infrastructure, they created an architecture, and they created a city that for them became what would be known eventually as an all-black town. And these all-black towns actually proliferated most of the central United States all the way to Oregon and California. And the all-black towns were spaces of freedom. They were spaces of emancipation. They were spaces in which black voices and black bodies created the very spaces that they themselves wanted to be in and wanted to see, that they themselves wanted to be a part of. And to think then in 1922 that Boley, Oklahoma existed at the very same moment that the Museum of Modern Art was beginning to form itself uh, in New York City and be completely forgotten and uh, disregarded as a space uh, was incredibly important to, to us. So too were architects like Amaza Lee Meredith, whose own house built in Petersburg, Virginia in 1939, despite the fact that she was not allowed to study architecture, uh, signaled for Mabel and myself an instance in which also architecture and architects could be imagined, designed and built by individuals who were not even allowed to access the spaces in which an education, for instance, was even a given. Amaza Lee uh, was not considered a, quote, architect, but for more than 30 years taught architecture and design at the university there. So too, could we look at the uh, redlining maps on our left, such as that you see on, on the left, and MoMA's exhibition in 1967 called The New City, Architecture and Urban Renewal. And the spaces of time between these two, while almost three decades, didn't necessarily change or improve or challenge what had happened with the revaluation of land, of property, and of people. Uh, between the mapping of Brooklyn and every major uh, metropolitan area in uh, the United States to the quote-unquote urban renewal uh, of Manhattan in MoMA's show in 67, um, what many would call, including June Jordan, in fact, Negro removal, the displacement of people in order to create new value systems on the, base, on the basis of land and architecture. And the violence that accompanied such urban renewal was ever present throughout this time. This violence that Jordan actually writes about quite extensively, quite evocatively, and we can only look to then architecture and spaces such as the front porch or the kitchen as places of not only of refusal, but also of, of resistance. And this is just one example of many, many uh, in Rochester. This is uh, a mother. She's protecting her son who is hiding behind the, the, the banister there as the police, over 1,100, came to evict all of the residents of this community so that they could build 
a highway. Another example of Overtown in Miami, over 8,000 individuals of color, mainly from the Caribbean, but also African American, uh, were forcibly displaced to make way for a highway. So what does it mean then to create an infrastructure not of highways, of communication, but maybe perhaps the possibility of people? What does it mean to say that an architecture of people and for and by people can actually happen? And that architecture then is the response that is one of potential and not denial. We look to uh, more recent examples, such as the dumping of uh, hazardous chemicals across America, in particular uh, in the East Coast, where black bodies were used to uh, stop, in fact, or hope to stop uh, the dumping of these chemicals. Of course, it went on uh, up to Flint, Michigan, a water crisis that is in part created by redlining from the 1930s, in which, again, the devaluation of land owned or, or, or uh, settled upon by, by black Americans um, does not have an infrastructure uh, that is suitable to maintain its water supply. And so we come to June Jordan and Skyrise for Harlem what would be named or renamed by Esquire magazine, Instant Slum Clearance, a problematic title in and of itself. Perhaps we can talk about that on stage, in which the presence of Harlem not only on the pages of a magazine, a men's magazine, mind you, uh, spoke to the possibility that every person deserved or could have a view that every person could have access to fresh air and to an infrastructure that was created or supported or amplified by them, but also the notion that Jordan herself, through her words, through language, could in effect redesign, reimagine, and recreate an architecture that spoke to her, that spoke to people and families and communities that she was most familiar with. I'm not going to talk about the article just yet, but I wanted to show the kind of chronological arc in, in how Mabel and I, and eventually an extraordinary group of people that would become known as our advisory council, uh, including Jennifer here, um, would begin to redefine the terms of an architecture that perhaps didn't exist just that, just yet. And I have to always include this image. We had three convenings. It's probably the first and last time that this many people of color will ever set foot in the founder's room of uh, the Museum of Modern Art. And these conversations were the most extraordinary, enlightening, and moving conversations one could ever have. It was here that we, as a group of people, including curators, Mabel and myself, and these extraordinary individuals, many of whom would then participate in the exhibition, um, came together to talk about what it means to redefine, reimagine, and reconstruct an architecture and an archive that didn't exist. And these were the terms that we came up with. First of all, the sites in the largest font were the cities that we chose as a group. 10 cities across America, 10 cities that had a legacy and a history that was fundamentally around or organized around division. The spaces that those cities could in effect be visualized through, and finally, the scales or the types of ideas, spaces, and tools through which all of these things could be understood. 
These were the terms that then we set forth, not only to the 10 participants uh, of the exhibition, but we allowed or in effect asked them and invited them to respond to these uh, as a means for beginning a project around what it means to be black in America, what it means to be a black architect in America, and what does it mean to, in effect, understand and respond to blackness within architecture in America. And so tonight, because this exhibition uh, opened at the height of the pandemic and subsequently closed in the midst of the pandemic only after a short period of weeks, despite over a thousand petitions to the museum directors and leaders, they closed the exhibition to make another one, ironically or not, about cars. <laughs> Part of the uh, extraordinary, uh, I would say extraordinary moment, one of many extraordinary moments in the making of this exhibition was the founding of the Black Reconstruction Collective, the BRC. And uh, the BRC was founded, and perhaps Yolanda can talk a little bit more about that. It was not Mabel and my purview, it was actually the participants' purview uh, to create the collective, which has now gone on to support and will continue to support uh, black artists and architects through grants and, and scholarships. But I, I show this image not for the title wall in the, in the back of the image, but for the banner at the front. And the banner is very particular because it was the manifesting statement of the BRC, what was written by them as the opening salve to the exhibition. Uh, it was also a means to cover the name of the former chief curator and founder of the Museum of Modern Arts Architecture and Design Collection, that of Philip Johnson, a committed and known member of the fascist party. So it was an elegant solution, if you will, but also a very particular way in which um, the how do we cross a threshold into an exhibition that had actually never happened before. And so I wanted to begin and kind of give you a very quick tour, if you will, of the exhibition. Uh, and I wanted to begin with Yolanda's work here, um, which she'll talk about more in a moment. Amanda Williams. Mario Gooden. Balala Kanjefus. Seku Cook. Jermaine Barnes. Emmanuel Admasu, and just to give you a detail of Emmanuel's work, this is covered with the black dust found on uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in the Atlantic Ocean. And the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is the l invisible line that Emmanuel says that when he crossed, moving from Ethiopia to Atlanta, he suddenly realized he had become black. And uh, Mitch McEwen, Walter Hood. And Walter's work is based on the 10 point program designed and affected by the Black Panthers in Oakland, in Oakland California. And then the last work, uh, which is number 11, David Hart is an artist, photographer, uh, a video artist um, based in Philadelphia. While he did not join the, the Black Reconstruction Collective, um, he, we did invite and commission him to do a particular work for us, which you'll see in a moment. But these are two scenes from a video in which he walked through and spent a great deal of time in um, South Central Los Angeles, documenting the homes 
and interiors of people who live there. And I'll conclude, despite the weird formatting on the, on the screen, I'll conclude with this image with the last work in the center by uh, Felicia Davis. And Felicia's work uh, was an antenna. In fact, it was designed as an antenna that when you walked into the space of the gallery, it would understand that your body was there and in fact would make a sound uh, at the entrance. So you would know and the sound would change uh, as you walked through the gallery depending on how many people were there. And over the course of the few weeks that the exhibition was opened, of course, the sound changed because more and more people were coming with their masks and their body suits and everything. And uh, of course, then it, it closed. And then the work on the right is the, that of, of David Hart. So <clears throat> we, would, we wanted the, his work to be seen like a window within the window of the city looking out. And so I just wanted to con conclude by saying that uh, June Jordan was a progenitor for Mabel and myself, and I think for the entire um, group of people that uh, I had the great fortune of working with in not only defining a new set of terms for how to think about and imagine architecture, but also her work, her words, her wisdom tells us all the possibility of, of perhaps answering or responding to the question of not only who we are now, but who we wish to be. So, thank you. Okay, um, it's really great to be here. Uh, I have to kind of catch my breath. I'm very honored and um, extremely humbled. I'm having a moment um, just to be in the presence of such greatness. Um, so uh, thank you, Whitfield. Um, your portrait, I feel, in this very roundabout way has like helped my work. Um, helped me like see June Jordan in a very different way than I knew her as a poet. And I feel so indebted to you because her work registers to me on multiple levels as a poet, a writer, um, as like just someone who dealt with uh, the issues of being a woman as equal to the issues of being black, as equal to the issues of how all of um, how blackness is actually much bigger than just um, a race and that um, multiple people occupy the position of being black as a result of colonialism and racism. And she kind of saw all that as she developed in her work and it's something that inspires me. So I have to thank you. Um, it's really, really wonderful um, to just be part of this. Then I have to thank Lindsay because she invited me to participate and I've enjoyed the conversations with her just about June Jordan as I've learned more. Um, and thank you to Sean um, who is responsible for part of my body of work um, and inspiration for another part that he hasn't even seen. Um, so I have to thank him as well. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Eliza. Um, all the wonderful people that I met this winter, it's been really great to be back here. I was a fellow 20 years ago, and so it's like kind of uh, been very different being here as a resident. I think I was more mature this time around. <laughs> And so it's been really um, just wonderful to be here. So I want to uh, start by just reading June Jordan. I've been reading a lot of June Jordan and I wanted to find something that I could share that, um, that sort of uh, resonated with the work I'd show. And it resonates in different ways and I'll go through that. Um, do I have to do like this? 
Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is an essay. I guess I should go. Go to me. Um, okay, so this is a poem I wrote uh, around the time I was a fellow, so about 20 years ago, um, related to the project um, that I was working on here. It wasn't my main project, but I was um, working on uh, sort of two projects at the same time. Um, my uh, project as a fellow, which was looking at the Aurelian Wall and uh, Roman imperialism, and then um, a project that was looking at gentrification in Harlem. Um, so basically, this, proje this project uh, was um, the Black City. And what happened was it became, I was actually not studying the Black City. I was looking at, I wanted to come up with alternatives to uh, gentrification and segregation. My idea was that if we made segregation, which we have, that we can come up with different alternatives. So I was really interested in just whatever alternative I could come up with. But in order to do that project, I actually had to research and learn more about what existed. And then that's kind of led me, and that led to the Black City. I was interested in the Black City Square. Um, like, you know, I'm interested in science fiction, I'm interested in um, just, it was like moving forward, but to move forward, I felt I had to understand the ground that we were standing on and how it got set. And it just kind of led me for the last, I don't know, 25 years to look back and to learn. Um, so I'm going to read June Jordan really to get into this. It, the essay is called Toward a Manifest New Destiny. Um, three, Manifest Destiny, first used in the U.S. Congress on January 3rd, 1846, by Representative Robert C. Winthrop of Massachusetts, who spoke on the subject of the right of our de manifest destiny to spread over this whole continent. That's his quote. 30 years ago, white publications loved to headline stories about my neighborhood, my family and me with three words, the Negro problem. I remember rapid adjustment of my mind from a state of plain puzzlement to anger. I'd be passing by a subway newsstand and there'd, there'd be, um, and there I'd see it, uh, that incredibly incendiary formulation that implied that we are Negroes, had created our own difficulties and further that we Negroes were the only ones who could or should give a damn. So many Americans su succumb to that game. And again and again, slick magazines and daily papers blamed the victim and erased or exculpated, exculpated the perpetrators perpetrators of the crime. This was all the more remarkable as the context was one of wild white violence, which meant that Negro difficulties might well include catching a bullet in the brain if your local sheriff discovered you were trying to register to vote. What finally blew away these print media fabrications, what finally replaced them with factual knowledge leading to a national and worldwide uproar that in turn led to the Civil Rights Act of 1960 and other pivotal laws was the camera. Regardless of the caption beneath the photograph, Regardless of the text read by the white voiceover on film, visual portraits of our history carried the day. You could not watch a white man screaming as he overturned or set fire and burned up a Greyhound bus and then still be confused about who exactly had done what, where, and when. I wonder what it will take. Oh, I'll just stop there. And so reading that, you know, I think about Rodney King and and how um, how now we are confused when we look at um, visual records about things. But at that time, the visual record 
um, you know, really made a difference. And, and also I, I, the exhibit resonates with me and her work with photography. So when I, when I read this, I'm thinking about how, you know, how she understood photography in a specific way and then that influenced her work. Um, kind of working backwards, um, when she talks about the Negro problem, I also had a similar, oops. Hmm. Okay. I also had a similar um, experience when I was doing research for the Black City Project at uh, the library in Columbia University where I was looking for, you know, again, researching segregation and I'm in a section of the library looking at crisis magazines um, for, from the NAACP's uh, journals. And then there's this section, like a whole column of books on, with different variations of titles on the Negro problem. I didn't know there was a Negro problem. And so I'm looking at these books um, and basically the Negro problem, in my mind, it was, it began with the emancipation of the quote unquote Negroes. Um, but it's interesting to hear her also, you know, years before me um, talking about this word. Then manifest destiny. So a lot of my work uh, deals with looking at laws, laws that uh, relate to how we use public space, um, restrictions on public space, who can occupy, who, who has a right to public space, but then also housing because in the United States it's extremely segregated and looking at the restrictions that, that kind of influence that. I have a slide that's missing, but it's okay. It's a timeline and I'll, I'll kind of come back to that because I've been cataloging events and putting them in timelines, and the timelines have grown for each project and kind of morphed with each project. I also do maps. This is a map of Los Angeles. The previous map was of Los Angeles in the 19th century, which was basically up in the right-hand corner. And then this is showing the migration of the African-American community um, along Central Avenue in Los Angeles. So part of what restricts their movement has to do with restrictive covenants, violence, um, and it's not just against African Americans, it's also against Asians, uh, Chinese, Japanese. Um, at that time, it was against Russians, Italians, um, Irish. There was a, a large group of, of minorities who were um, excluded, uh, but African Americans were singled out. So with the mapping, there are specific places that I found um, that so I hadn't intended to do this series, but I found these amazing narratives of resistance. And this one, I'll just talk about it because you can't see it, is one about uh, the use of highways to um, remove black neighborhoods. And this is Sugar Hill. I, I was, made them in the form of a dictionary. So it's, the project is, is a, um, a dictionary. And it's cataloging different black neighborhoods, city by city as I go along and significant sites. And so this site in Sugar Hill was actually the home of Hattie Mc McDaniel, who um, won an uh, Academy Award for Gone with the Wind. But a lot of people don't know that she was actually an activist and that she was part of a class action suit that um, got rid of uh, restrictive covenants in Los Angeles. And so this this is just telling that story and it's um, representing the properties. Sugar Hill was uh, formerly an exclusive white neighborhood that then um, uh, blacks in Hollywood and uh, lawyers and doctors moved into and their neighbors uh, sued them to have them removed. And they fought the suit. They had Hattie McDowell, Daniel, 
hosted parties in her home and um, kind of, you know, they were political and garnered support for um, their case. And then you saw this already. That's a shot from the installation, which Sean showed on the blue model, which is a piece of Los Angeles. Um, each of the plates relates to a section also in the model. There's on both sides a timeline, but I will go into that later. Um, Mokata. Uh, the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Art. This was actually a project that I was working on when I was a fellow. Um, I had just gotten a, a small project for um, a museum client, and she wanted, it was to renovate a museum, a very small museum, um, but she wanted a map of Africa in the reception area. Um, I thought, because it's the Museum of the African Diaspora, a map of the African diaspora made more sense for her. And we presented it and she loved it. And so then uh, we, we took this map and it kind of three-dimensionalized it within their space. What's being mapped here is the uh, transatlantic slave trade. But in our project, we also mapped uh, uh, military migrations and political migrations and economic migrations. And this is a project that I've continued to work on and it's uh, influenced the Biennale project that I'm doing. Um, so this is the reception area of the, a, a clip of the reception area of the museum where the two dimensional map is painted on the space and then it's brought out as uh, furniture in third dimension within the space. So it surrounds the entire space that you walk within. And this is just an image of it. And then uh, moving forward, this is after the Los Angeles project. I uh, started to work on Arkansas um, for a installation at uh, Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. The installation was called Architecture at Home. And for this, I was working uh, with my office and we were making a prototype for a home. Um, but then we were asked to consider the, the place and to try to have a way of relating to the community there. So I started looking for the African American community and they were absent. And so then I started to look at sundown towns because I suspected that they had been there at some point. And as I was doing research, I found that there were African American towns, there were freedmen towns, like what uh, Sean talked about, but they were forcibly removed, sometimes violently, um, other times just, you know, they weren't killed, but they, their, their spaces were demolished. Um, and then the sundown, sundown town rules were a way of enforcing the, the removal of the people. Um, and there were many, many cities um, in uh, Northwest Arkansas, especially where this happened. Arkansas was very much a belt, a kind of productive belt during slavery. Um, and so I started to map them. And this is just a clip of the, this is a 50 year time period of movements and events that um, resulted in uh, removals and segregation. On the right-hand side are actually events and movements for African-Americans. And on the left-hand side, I started to look at the indigenous Americans because they were also forcibly removed from this area. Basically, just to start the state of Arkansas, they had to clear the land first. So in this work, I find patterns um, that, you know, again, it's not just African Americans, even though that's my focus. And some of the projects, you know, this one features um, Native Americans, but the other featured Asian Americans because it was California. Um, and these are just some details of the way that the timeline enters into the architecture. So there's a house, which is the slide before this, and then as you, so you, you see it in the landscape and 
It's the components of the house, but not the house itself. So by components, it's all the solid parts like closets and kitchen cabinets and things like that, that the house is made out of. And then um, as you move closer, you see these layers of history. So you can actually read uh, the history as you go through the component. Each component is a 100 year time block um, going from the founding of the state of Arkansas up to the present. Um, and this is my last slide. This is my last slide. So these are the components. One is for the entry and living room, kitchen and dining room. Um, there's an actual house design that then we distilled the components of the house for this installation in the woods. Thank you. It's amazing when you put people together whose work, there's a certain serendipity and overlaps that you can expect and then ones you can't expect. And I was struck, first of all, by everyone's you know, eloquence and deep thought that they took to respond to this program and its invitation. I want to say thank you, first and foremost, for that. But also to the profound investigation of loss and the efforts in each of your projects to re recover. I'm thinking of Justin Randolph Thompson's The Recovery Plan in Florence, and I use that as a, that, that title kept coming up in my mind as something that seems to unite the projects that the three of you have, whether in visual art, in architecture, or thinking about the museum space. Many of the things that we've seen today, the conversation is happening, even the conversation we're having today is in light of something happening in a gallery space. The role that institutions like museums play in helping to recover this loss. Um, and I wondered if, just the, as the three of you have now had a chance to share this in your work, if maybe you wanted to think um, before I maybe ex um, offer the opportunity for one or two questions from the audience to think about how history serves as a driver for the new work that you're creating and this effort of re learning from an archive, t finding archival photographs, recreating an archive, um, or responding to the lack of recognizing in absence there's probably a history missing there. Um, I don't know if Whitfield or whoever would like to start. Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll give it a stab. Um, what impresses me the most is how in the times we're living in now, a lot of things we thought were worked through had improved. You know, a lot of these things are happening again. And you, know, you can see the uh, similarities uh, between banning books and uh, um, taking rights away from people. That's one of the things that um, <clears throat> uh, it actually sort of drives my urge to look at history and to think about, for my own personal work, to think about uh, the lives of the people who inhabited the planet before and how we just keep making the same mistakes over and over and over and over. Um, I was particularly moved by both your, your presentations. They were very much uh, in line with some of my issues, you know, mm. obviously. Mm. And I like, I, I like that um, the title uh, or rather the the name, what was it, uh, Exodusters? The Exodusters. Yeah. Exodusters. Okay. Exodusters. Can I use that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I, I think, um, if, if I may, Yolanda, I mean, the exodusters for, for all of us, uh, for Mabel and I, as we were beginning the project, um, for us became, uh, alongside Jordan and, and so many others, the model builders. They were the architects for us. They mm -hmm. were the ones who set forth whether they were allowed to or not. They set mm -hmm. forth into spaces and land and, and places uh, on the continent that had not yet even become a state, uh, such as Oklahoma, and to create then a space for themselves alongside, more often than not, Native uh, and Indigenous peoples, um, spoke to not only the possibility to recover, overcome, and reimagine the loss that they themselves had obviously been experiencing, but for us would become a kind of model for thinking about architecture, not in the modernist paradigm, which has always been about repair or fixing something or solving something, usually it was solving something, but um, could become a place of potential. And so replacing loss with potential or reimagining loss as a space of potential um, through language mm -hmm. and through form and through very kind of, that could be all of us, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're saying, it's saying that I'm talking too much. Um, uh, that you could, uh, in effect, redesign and remake and, uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. And where does architecture lie in that, um, in that equation, right? So I think when I see Yolanda's work in particular, uh, because yours was really the only project in reconstructions that had a timeline, that had specific dates, that had maybe Walters to a degree, but uh, really placed history front and center. Um, as something to build upon, as something to respond to, and uh, to rethink uh, in, a very in a very provocative way. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that notion of building and who is building for whom and why uh, is essential, just as who is making a portrait or a painting for whom and for mm -hmm. whom to see uh, mm -hmm. that portrait. Sorry, Yolanda. No, um, I just wanted to speak a little to the the historical part because what I've what I've learned is um, looking back is I see cycles and patterns, and the work becomes important in the way that it shares those patterns, makes them visible to others, um, and I. I don't know, I guess my hope is that when we do see that we're repeating, you know, that you can look at the 1860s, which is the period of the Civil War and emancipation um, from slavery, and then the 1960s, 100 years later, there's another um, move for um, freedom and like civil rights. And unfortunately, <laughs> we're like in a kind of down cycle right now. And so I just think, well, what will happen in 2060? Because, you know, we're, we're kind of in a repressive period. And I think what, Lavelle, what you, uh, would feel what you said about like things repeating, um, you know, I too am surprised that things are repeating, are repeating, but I, I don't know. I think it's because we don't look back that they repeat. And when I read June Jordan's, that little piece of the essay, when she talks about the photograph and how it couldn't be disputed, the violence and the horror um, against African-Americans, but then it's like we live in an era now where people look at the same photographs and they actually see the person who's being victimized as an aggressor. Mm -hmm. And that's like mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I was uh, particularly um, moved 
by all of this because I grew up in the Bronx. Where I grew up in the Bronx was called the Bronx when I moved there. By the time I left, it was called the South Bronx. Yeah. The South Bronx, yeah. uh, what do you call it? Fort Apache started creeping its way up. And it, it, was, it, was, it was interesting because, you know, growing up, and I'll admit this, um, the way that my relatives, part of my family was from the South, the other part is from the Caribbean. My relatives uh, thought of those who lived in Harlem as being the unfortunate ones. The ones who made it out to the boroughs were, you know, the, the upwardly mobile ones. And uh, <clears throat> by the time I was uh, in college, my, uh, the neighborhood surrounding us was a shambles, you know. I, I witnessed that. And as a high school student, I used to walk the streets and look at the buildings and look at the, the empty lots. And, you know, that kind of hope that you talked about, the, the dreams that, um, that June had, about creating a, bl a better place for mm -hmm. all of us. I used to walk the streets and I used to really, I, I, I actually would make like little drawings of buildings, you know, not mentally, make little drawings of, you know, houses and mentally I would paint the, the buildings that were, 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 were peeling away and, and decaying. Then I moved after college, I moved to Harlem, which had already been decimated. Mm -hmm. And by that time, uh, uh, I, went, I went through a lot of the same kind of pain. I used, to, I used to look at the place and think, well, how could we make this place better for the people who are here? instead of waiting for someone else to take the land and refurbish it for themselves. Now, this, we're talking about the mid 80s at this point. And <clears throat> I got an apartment for $150 for four bedrooms. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a rat. <laughs> so, um, I stayed there as long as I could and then finally left. But um, I, 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 was, I was like really wishing that those neighbors who were just so sweet, they were gritty and they were, you know, throwing them back all the time. But uh, they, they had a right to have decent surroundings. And it, it really bothered me. You know, mm -hmm. and so I have a I have a hard time going to Harlem now. You know, I have a, I have a hard time because I still have the old Harlem that was like you know my mother. She took us to the Apollo and she showed us all the fenders and it was like a cultural experience. This is where you went to see real black, authentic black culture, and. It's just different now. So um, I, I, I mean, a, a lot of that has been part of my, you know, my, my ax to grind uh, growing up in the Bronx. And so, so I, I, felt, I felt that connection with June and her, her project. I think a, a lot of, um... Well, it's interesting, like thinking about the freedmen's towns, and they weren't freed women's towns; they were freedmen's towns, but uh, freed people's towns. Where, um, like Sean, as you pointed out, these towns reflected the imaginings of, you know, the people who built them, and they literally paid for and built them. Um, you know, that's, and that's something that uh, we don't actually 
we're not really told that history, so it's not a resource that people can draw from that gives people strength, that's an example, you know, that they can build off of. Um, but the, the kind of other example that exists is of African Americans moving into already existing communities. Mm -hmm. Um, and building something out of them, like Harlem was actually occupied by Jewish communities mm -hmm. who were marginalized before African American communities moved in. They moved, the, the Jewish communities moved out for, to the suburbs for a better life. Then African Americans moved in, some of them moved out. Um, you know, and then we have the cycle of gentrification, but, um, Similarly, you know, that, that happens like in Los Angeles, there was a town, Bronzeville. Bronzeville was, uh, during the war period, African Americans moved into the vacated homes of the uh, Japanese Americans who weren't allowed to own property. Um, so their landlords weren't getting rent when they were sent, when the Japanese were sent to internment camps and they were looking to get rent and <laughs> advertising to different communities. And I saw posters advertising. They had prepared posters for the Latin community, Latin American community. And I guess that didn't work out. And it ended up that African-Americans moved into little Tokyo and it became Bronzeville during the internment period. Um, and Bronzeville is really significant because it was like the birth of bebop and all of these inventions of things happened in this really short, intense period of Bronzeville. They packed the people in so the living conditions were not good. Um, but, you know, that's another ex example. But I think this, so that's the example that you know, of the making do example of people kind of, African Americans kind of making something great out of a lesser condition um, and persevering. But I think we don't know enough about another kind of perseverance, which is, you know, enslaved people becoming free and building communities. And so I think being in the reconstruction show, um, just kind of seeing there was a map of all of the freedmen's towns, you know, that was to me like really impressive. It left an impression and then kind of led to, uh, you know, some of the research like for the Arkansas project, um, which looked at freedmen towns there and then their, you know, removals. But, but I, I think a lot about young people and how, you know, they need to know about these histories and that it can make them stronger, um, give them hope, um, so that if they're doing imaginary drawings in their heads, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. they can make something out of it. Mm -hmm. it One, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. One of the first installations I, uh, well, major installations I did was in Denton, Texas. There was a community called Quaker Town, which was forced, they were forced or coerced or whatever, intimidated into leaving that area because they said they needed a city park. But the fact was that this settlement or, you know, it was a very self-sufficient, they had their own morticians and doctors in this settlement, uh, they were um, adjacent to a white woman's college. And so the town of Denton wanted this community gone. They even brought in the KKK to further intimidate the people to move. Um, the show that I did, which was at the University of North Texas, had uh, raised a lot of controversy because the mayor of Denton did not like having that KKK associated with her town. Okay, There was that, and then there were actually some people who remembered being pushed out, and so 
I'm saying all of this to say that <clears throat> we think sometimes that art is just something that is esoteric and we all make art for each other because we all understand it. We all absorb it. However, because of that exhibition, there's now a memorial in the mm -hmm. city park commemorating Quaker Town, you know? That's so, cool. I mean, that's one way that we can pass these legacies and these histories on to the other generations. Just not, 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 not allowing those atrocities to slip into myth. If, if I may, on that note of how art can help us change our perspectives of history, re retrieve lost episodes of history, encourage young people know, to know about that, and think about how to empower people to create their own decent surroundings. Whitfield used this phrase, and I think that's a, a very apt one to think about with regard to the exhibition upstairs. Um, so exactly those themes are addressed, I, I hope everyone will see in, in the show, um, that highlights those um, driving forces in June Jordan's work uh, during her early career. And with, with that, I would like to bring this conversation to a close and, and encourage everybody to come upstairs, take the opportunity to ask further questions of our wonderful speakers this evening who have, in this span of an hour, however long it's been, I've learned even more. I think if I could do the exhibition again, I'd do it with even more information. These exchanges just continue to be extraordinarily dynamic, and I'm very grateful to each of you for your perspectives. Thank you. for what you said.